Corky Coyman from Denker Capital uh, is our go-to man on anything to do with banking. But we're going to have an unusual discussion today, Corky, where we'll also be talking a bit about the blockchain and decentralized finance, DeFi. But let's start off with Ukraine. Um, you didn't foresee it. I don't know um, whether your investors are now complaining that uh, you didn't see what perhaps you should have. Yeah. No, it's it's it's... Uh, yeah, it's one of those things you replay it in your mind the whole time as as an investor and as a portfolio manager. And, you know, the signs were there the whole time. We actually liked Russia because of what it was doing to its balance sheet. You know, it, but what one didn't see, it was actually preparing for war. You know, uh, the, since 2014, Putin had been making his, his economy and his balance sheet sanction proof and building up reserves. Well, Funny enough, the reserves in the end didn't help him, and he and he did miscalculations. But as a portfolio manager, one just learns each time again. You know, the troop buildup. We all believed him, saying that you know he he just wants its exercises, and we thought maybe it's just you know the two provinces. Any case, what we did do is fortunately towards the end of last year, when Tinkoff and Spurbank got fairly expensive, or Tinkoff specifically, we started reducing that. Um, and when when it looked as if it was going to invade and it didn't invade, we immediately sold the remaining spur banks. Uh, but still, it, it's the whole region has taken an enormous club, to put it in that terms. Uh, yeah, uh, the EU banks, European banks are down 20% because almost every bank has some exposure and the insurers have some exposure to Russia, even just indirectly. Most like ING... 0.8%. But the fear suddenly in that region is that European the ECB won't hike interest rates for a while, that they might prevent the banks from buying back shares, which everybody had bargained on. So um, interesting in terms of our investors, we've been communicating with our investors as much as we can. You know, our Russian exposure at, at the point of when, when the markets were closed is 0.2% in the fund. So that was very small. And we've actually had small inflows. I think investors are starting to learn that even if you've got a crisis wrong when it happens, when it has happened and share prices go 20% down, it's time to rather buy than sell, unless obviously it's a structural change. And and maybe if I'll just continue on that for one one more minute. Corky, just, just yeah. a moment, if I can interrupt there. We've got uh, quite a lot of people who've joined us on our Twitter spaces. So welcome. This is our very first Twitter spaces uh, conversation. I'm talking with Corky Coyeran from Denker Capital. And uh, we're just picking up on the invasion in Russia and how it's affected his job, really, which is as uh, as a, a, a specialist in buying banks around the world, including those who some of whom have been directly affected. Yeah, well, banks, insurers, debt collectors, exchanges, asset managers, but the financial space, but 50% of it, 60% is banks. But but Alec, the, the big debate we had in the team uh, was, one, do you now sell European banks and buy, let's say, Brazilian banks or Indonesian banks? So get away from get away from Europe, in other words. Well, get away from Europe, and then if this is a structural change, and we're seeing higher commodity prices and higher food prices for three years, countries like Indonesia and Brazil actually benefit. Uh, and Indonesia is a big coal exporter, big palm oil exporter. It's actually, in terms of oil, it's, it's neutral. It imports as much as so, but. But the European bank shares had fallen so much. Uh, you know, ING yesterday was back on a dividend yield of 10%. Yeah, almost so Just half. explain that. Nice and simple, 10%. So in other words, you invest in it today. As long as their profits remain the same amount, you get a 10% yield, which is a heck of exactly. a lot more than you get in, in interest. Cash. In cash. Okay. There's obviously the tax on that. So it makes it after tax a 7.5% yield, which is still very good. And our prognosis is that you know, Europe will grow after this. And so that in five years' time, that 7.5% of today's or yesterday's price grows to about 10 11%. So, yeah, so, so bank shares and insurers in Europe have just fallen to levels where you said you, know, you can't sell. What you could do maybe, and we did a bit of that, is a share. There are two shares in Austria, Raffaison and Erstebank. 
uh, Ralph Fison has 30% of its operations in in uh, Ukraine and Russia. They're ring-fenced in terms of capital and systems, but so 30% of your business is there. And Erste have got no business in, uh, so but the prices have almost fallen the same. And you say, okay, and we sold some Ralph Fison and we bought Erste. Uh, it seems overnight now uh, this morning that the likelihood is increasing that there will first be a, a ceasefire and talks. And I'm not, not sure if, you, if investors have looked yet, but European share prices started rebounding yesterday and today. Both Raffaison and Erste are up 11%. <laughs> so obviously, that's always what happens in a crisis. The markets first, because there's no information, assume the worst. And then as information becomes available, it starts pricing more accurately. And in this case, obviously, if the war was to end now where it is and you start talking, you know, then there's a lot of mispricing because of the fears were even in terms of does he invade the Baltics next? Does he go into Georgia next? And, you know, so the market is now starting to say, well, maybe he's learned and he won't do that. Corky, I had an interesting chat yesterday with Sean Pesh, who I'm sure you recall. Uh, he's now in the UK. Was been there, for a couple of, there we go. Yeah, he's uh, he's been in the UK for hmm, 20 odd years. That's right. But he That's right. he had a theory. He said that uh, from what he can, his gut is telling him, and it's only a theory, it's no inside track. It appears as though what Russia wants from the peace talks is likely to be acceptable to Ukraine, i.e., Ukraine says we're not going to join NATO, which is not a big deal because NATO hasn't exactly defended them. And on the other hand, Russia says you give us the the region in eastern uh, Ukraine where it is a dominant Russian speaking people, and they are allowed to join Russia. So that's that that is seems to be on the table. And what Sean was saying was that it does appear as though a a, a ceasefire or a a peace could break out any day if that were to happen. What then would that do to your portfolio of banking shares and generally to to stocks in Europe. Well, by the way, I actually happened to listen to that interview. It was a great interview, and I, I thought Sean explained it very well. And I don't agree with his ABN Amaro call, <laughs> but that's another. <laughs> um, yeah, there are better shares in Europe to buy than ABN Amaro, but okay, same valuations. But uh, I agree with him that if if that is, and that's what we thought Putin wants, he kept on saying the only thing he wants, he doesn't want Ukraine to slip towards the West uh, via EU membership or via NATO membership. And so, you know, that is really what he said was his aim. The problem is, if you listen to guys like Bill Browder, who, re- who uh, wrote Red Notice, and, you know, he, he basically says you can never believe a word that uh, Putin says. Uh, he seems to be almost be as bad as Trump. Well, that's that. Now we're going, but you know you can't. Well, they believe, are friends. <laughs> yeah, you can't believe what he says. So, at that time when he started invading uh, Ukraine, I just became too afraid to try and read his mind, and and also we expected more of the worst, and just wanted to see how it goes. But Sean is right. If he, I mean, tactically, he's achieved what he's wanted to. If that is what he wanted to at least for the short term. And so he could go to the table now and say, okay, this is what I said all along. Although he did say at the beginning, we're just doing exercises, but okay, uh, let's sit now. If that is the case and the war ends, then one of these negotiations or the key negotiation point is what do we do with sanctions? Do we now reverse the sanctions and does he make that a condition? then the world will fly because then obviously oil price comes crashing down, uh, commodity prices come down, uh, and the world growth starts picking up again, and you'll have a huge relief rally in markets. And it seems to be happening starting this morning. Um, even the ruble I see is up 8% this morning, strengthened, you know, so that the reserves might be released. But it's very fluid at this stage. You're now going to the stage of a lot of volatility, you know, the, I think the time for the meeting or the day hasn't even been finalized yet. And so you're going to see a lot of volatility. But I think the fact that they're talking is a big step forward. Yeah, especially if it is now accompanied by a ceasefire. 
Uh, so you can get civilians out. Also, the Ukrainians, they benefit because they, and if you saw Poland is offering to send a whole squadron of MiGs to MiG fighter jets to, to Ukraine. So Ukraine gets to replenish. It's, it's, so uh, there's a lot of tactical things. If, yeah, so it's volatile. But I think initially market mm-hmm. will rally because there was too much bad news priced in. Well, those MiGs would be, uh, could be Putin's worst nightmare, given that he's got a 40 kilometer long exactly. supply chain that's, exactly. that's bogged down. And if those MiGs uh, do get unleashed on that supply chain, it could be carnage. But uh, you mentioned B- uh, Bill Browder. I did meet him in London and had a, had a long chat with him after reading his book, yeah. Red Notice. And uh, he, he, I guess, would be saying, uh, just be careful about anything that comes out of Russia, given what, what happened with his partner, Magnitsky, yeah, who yeah. was, of course, uh, uh, murdered. And now we've got the Magnitsky Act, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. But from a, from a broader perspective, from, a, from a, a global perspective, the way you've outlined it now is that if the war ends, for whatever reason and with whatever motives, that is going to have a, an immediate impact on Mr. Market. If it doesn't, if, if these peace talks fall down and the war continues, say, for another month, six, yeah. nine, 12 months, yeah. what then are we likely to see? Yeah, then, then sadly, uh, Europe is, is, uh, will fall back and, and there's a lot of uncertainty then because the risk is the longer the war goes on that Putin does do something stupid or that, indeed, he says by Poland supplying mix to Ukraine – that this is an act of war on NATO and that NATO gets dragged in. And then then really your commodity prices, your oil prices go higher and stay high and your food prices stay high. Um, and then you'll find countries like South Africa actually benefit, Brazil benefits Indonesia. So then we would, if we see this as a, a six-month, nine-month problem and the after effects stay with us for three years, we would actually buy a bit of Brazilian banks. We actually started doing that. They are actually cheap because of, of uh, you know, the president there having been and, you know, all the problems they've had. But Indonesia is an unbelievable country, really benefits from it. And so we would start doing that. And I think markets would start looking towards emerging markets. The one underlying theme that will remain is that the Fed will hike interest rates. Just an interesting anecdote here or or piece of history. 73, I think October 73, we saw the Yom Kippur War. And you'll recall that a huge effect on oil prices. Oil prices went up. But the Fed actually, because of the inflationary problems, still hiked interest rates. And it's actually an interesting precedent that at this stage, I think they'll look at inflation Despite the war, they'll say we first got to protect the dollar and protect consumer savings and still hike interest rates. So the interest rate hikes in the US will continue. Um, and that's obviously is good for financial shares and not so good for the rest of the market. In Europe, whether they'll hike interest rates or postpone it, I think they'll postpone it. But even there, if inflation in Europe starts running 7 8%, you can't sit with negative interest rates. So I do think the underlying theme is interest rates will keep trending up. These are real complex issues and uh, perhaps uh, difficult to call, certainly in the short term. But when we have a look at long-term trends, you've been doing a lot of work on decentralized finance, which is not surprising because the whole blockchain revolution has to have massive risk uh, issues for banks, uh, which is your area of speciality. As you're reading it right now, how how big a risk is it to established banks, given that big organizations find it really difficult to move oil tankers? And if you've got this iceberg sitting there in the in the form of blockchain, cryptocurrencies, DeFi, uh, how are they dealing with that? Or is there anyone in the world that we can look at that's actually yeah. taking it on board? Yeah. Well, there are a few banks that have already really moved fast. JP Morgan is actually one. They've got their own blockchain Onyx for clients to transact on. Uh, Wells Fargo and HSBC have actually got a joint uh, blockchain for clients to transact on. There's a bank in Signature Bank, which by luck we were invested in us, not by luck. They, they, they were one of these guys always on the front foot. And so if it was going to happen, it was going to happen to them. But they got involved and started a a blockchain and a, um, 
a, a trading uh, exchange, Signet, uh, and they are growing the loan book at 30%, also taking, um, or within the regulatory framework, are allowing Bitcoin deposits and Bitcoin lending. So there are a lot of banks, uh, so by the way, Visa, MasterCard, the same. Visa has actually really made massive strides in providing uh, for crypto payments on the so-called rails, it, it, you know, it's it, its operations. Uh, actually, even Standard Bank have got a, a JV with Shinan Bank in Korea, exploring the possibility of you know, a blockchain to facilitate payments. And just by the way, for the uninitiated, what blockchain really does, the technology, um, and obviously it was blockchain one and the second level was through Ethereum where you get smart contracts on, on, on top of the blockchain. What that really does is it facilitates, it allows so-called 24-7, 24 times 7 um, transactions. So there is nothing like I want to do a payment on Friday evening, but the banks are now closed. I can only do it. The bank can only effect the transfer on Monday morning. Uh, blockchain allows, because it's all computer-driven, 24-7. Uh, it also allows immediate. If you make a payment, it's within a few minutes, depending on you know, the, the size. And so things happen quicker uh, and continuously and actually, in theory, at this stage, cheaper. Because that's the challenge to the banks. So your big challenge is, I think, twofold. You, you've highlighted it. The size of the ship is an advantage and a disadvantage. So JP Morgan is such a big ship, it can afford to put 10 billion and did um, into blockchain. Citigroup have hired 100 engineers, <laughs> 100 engineers, putting them in a room and saying, okay, guys, build us a blockchain. Uh, Capit well, Capitech actually is different because it's got it's in, in, in innovation and so on. But a smaller bank uh, cannot do that. So you're a large bank, but a large organization also has the, the, the negative. If it's got the wrong board and the wrong management team, you know, it becomes institutionalized. So what we're really testing management as well is, is how institutionalized is your thinking. Uh, they call it uh, cognitive entrenchment, <laughs> that you know, you're so entrenched in your history that you say, oh, this is, we've seen this before, there's another, it won't happen. Uh, the regulators are saying we can't do anything, so we'll wait for the regulator. Your your teams, your management teams that are on the front foot and, and by nature more entrepreneurial, like let's say first round, and they've already experimented. You know, so they already, they will have created teams that said, have a look at this for us. Your guys who are fighting other problems Potentially something like apps, I don't think so, but let's say you could be so taken up by your boardroom struggles that you're just not getting around to dealing with this new threat. And that's that's a big problem at this point in time. But, but something that I think uh, would occur to anybody listening to you is, hang on, if you can do a transfer through this decentralized ledger, through Bitcoin or, or uh, various other uh, uh, op um, opportunities through the blockchain, then who needs a bank? Why do you need a bank yeah. to be in between yeah. you? Yeah. Uh, uh, Stephen Sidley, who wrote the book Beyond Bitcoin, well, with Simon Dingle, and we actually had a, a breakfast with him and have used him internally for a podcast and, uh, and obviously writing the book, they put out their tongue in cheek and saying, this is the end of banking, although they then put in brackets as we know it. <laughs> but he makes the point that Banks have got such large infrastructures that have this high cost base that make it very difficult for them to compete with this low cost uh, new development on, on the blockchain technology. So, I look, <laughs> I'm just an analyst. I shouldn't be pro banks or negative banks, but yeah, but so far, what we've observed is, is two things. And number one, the whole fintech challenge of the previous three, four years really galvanized banks into what we call digitalization. So the way of delivering services to clients and the branch, as we know it, is dead. In fact, branches are most probably dead and COVID helped there to get people out of branches and getting used to work via the internet. So the banks... The blockchain is really your middleware, so 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 to speak. So you, you've got to 
still take away another layer and you can't you can't sit with 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 two but i do think that banks realize that there's huge focus on reducing cost and reducing your head office space and so I think they'll continue that. You'll see staff numbers of banks coming down, uh, physical space coming down, and the, the quicker ones will react. But there's a just a second problem. A lot of the costs that we deal with, that we pay for, is due to regular, regulatory overheads. And so the blockchain players or the DeFi players that they call the decentralized finance and D apps, you know, decentralized apps that they build on the blockchain, they've got the advantage of playing outside the regulatory space. So in that space at the moment, you can get very high yields, um, but it's not regulated. And so once they get regulated and the SEC in America has already said, you know, we will regulate you, and by the way, this war will actually accelerate that movement because the the war shows how money laundering is facilitated on on the blockchain, and you know, so so because you can't track it, you don't you know who owns it. it. Yeah, so we yeah. Are obviously hear the the good ones of guys sending money to Ukraine, <laughs> but there's also Russian oligarchs who are moving the money very quickly, you know, out of so. Um, but so the regulator is going to step in and, and force the exchanges on the blockchain to become part of the regulatory system. And a lot of this massive gearing that you're seeing and the irresponsible products, as the regulator sees it, um, will be curbed and then costs on the blockchain will also go up. That's so interesting. If the regulator can do it, though, I guess that's the big question. Can, can uh, you regulate this? Yes, uh, in quite a few countries, and I've been keeping a list, but starting with Korea, uh, actually Russia was the first to do blo- uh, By the way, China just banned it. <laughs> you, can't, you can't trade crypto. But Korea has already done it, where, and a lot of other countries have followed where you are. Actually, in South Africa as well, um, the, the blockchain exchanges are only allowed to accept the customer after they've KYC'd it. Now, let's know your client, you know, the whole regulatory proof of address, proof of you know, a telephone number, etc. cetera. So, um, do, you think the, do you think the Guptas ever did any KY, uh, know your client forms? Or indeed, if they filled them in, did they care to put the right stuff there? It's sometimes, Alec, it, it, Alec, you know, I, it just beggars I, I belief. I cry, I cry, yeah. I mean, they're inside the regulation. I mean, we've had ING Bank, Raiffeisen Bank, Sweat Bank, three large banks, Deutsche Bank, being fined hundreds of millions of dollars and billions, in fact, for facilitating money laundering from Russian clients through Latvia, uh, in in Denmark. Uh, and yeah, when you speak to the management, they say, our systems weren't good enough. This is 10 years ago. And now you've got the Guptas and all those guys having done it um, with nobody actually seeming to have picked it up. So you're quite right. The regulators uh, try and do what they can. The crooks always find a way around it. But, and but they're the always regula- a, a few steps ahead. Yeah. But, Corky, yeah. just to, just to uh, kind of wrap up, and it has been a fascinating discussion. Thank you. Uh, do you own Bitcoin yourself? I actually did to experiment. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I said to my team as well, guys, to really understand the space, we've got to try and, and just invest and see what happens, how easy it is, what are the costs, what what are the alternatives. Um, so, but it's, oh, it's peanuts. It's literally peanuts. It was to experiment. And immediately we started seeing, if you go into Luno, it's already a 5% charge. It's not it's not free. Yeah, you've got to go offshore to Coinbase or one of those to get to lower fees. But, you know, the... the so I personally think, and all our research shows that the the space is attracting the at brightest minds, which, by the way, means it's huge competition. But there will be winners. There will be Apples. There will be Googles. There will be Facebooks. But it's very early to see who they are now. But the coins themselves, Bitcoin, Ethereum, etc., um, of the so-called currencies, 
we think there's no value there. So if you were to invest, you want to invest, if you can predict that Cardano or one of those is going to be a winner because their application is so good, you know, then then those could be winners. But it's it's so early at this stage and the space is so fast moving and the banks will come and attack back. They will they will try and, and learn from their mistakes and see what the guys are doing, attract the best teams across uh, to come and work for them. Um, and, you know, so it, it, it's going to be a very competitive field. So continue to learn about it, continue to understand how it all works, but uh, be careful about investing. Is that your, your message? Yeah, yeah very, very clearly.